Hello everyone. Let's analyze. So today we're going to talk about local maxima and minima of multidimensional functions. So let's define what a local maximum and a local minimum is. And it's, well, what you might imagine, a local maximum is a maximum in a neighborhood of that point. And a local minimum is a minimum in a neighborhood of that point. Remember that we're defining a neighborhood as anything that contains an open ball centered at x naught. So a neighborhood of x naught is any region which contains on the inside an open ball that has x naught at the center. That necessarily means that x naught is the in the interior of the neighborhood. And so the set of all local minima and maxima are called the local or relative extrema of F. Let's also define a critical point, which you probably remember this idea from calculus one, and the idea remains the same. F has a critical point at X naught if the derivative of F at X naught is zero, which is equivalent to saying that the gradient is zero. Uh, because here we're talking about uh, differentiable functions from Rn to R. So the derivative is just the transpose of the gradient. So, again, this sh should all be familiar to you from Calculus 1. We have the first derivative test. If F maps an open set U and Rn to R is differentiable at x naught, then if x naught is a local min or max, then x naught is a critical point. Now notice the point of implication. A local min or max implies a critical point for a differentiable function, but not the other way around. So let's take a look at what this looks like before we get into the proof. So if we consider this map from R2 to R, if we give this a spin, we can see that the red dot there represents a local minimum. And of course, the tangent plane there is zero. In other words, the derivative in every direction is zero. So we have a tangent plane that is flat, right? Parallel to the x1, x2 plane. Now, if we consider this example, we have another situation where the tangent plane is flat, and in this case, the red dot represents a local maximum. So if I have a local minimum or a local maximum, as in this example, then we must have a critical point. But a critical point does not imply that we have a local minimum or maximum. Again, this should be familiar from calculus one. The classic example in calculus one is the graph of y equals x cubed. y equals x cubed has a critical point at x equals to zero, but it's neither a min nor a max. And you may have called it a saddle point then. Well, here we have another saddle point, and here we also see why it's called a saddle point. This looks like a saddle which we're all from Texas, so we know what a saddle looks like. This looks like a saddle. If I look in the direction along the horse's spine, if I were to put this saddle on a horse, right in that direction, the point where my derivative is zero, in other words, where the tangent plane is flat, it looks like a local minimum. But if I look along the flank of the horse, it looks like a local max right here where those two directions intersect, my tangent plane is precisely flat. But it's neither a min nor a max, right? If I go in this direction, I go higher. If I go in the flank direction, I go lower. So it's not locally minimum nor maximal. So the idea of the proof is quite simple. If the gradient is not zero, then there's a direction of steepest ascent or descent that I can go that would lead to a larger or lesser value locally. Remember that the direction of steepest ascent, 
is the unit vector that points in the direction of the gradient. And the direction of steepest descent is the unit vector that points in the direction of the negative gradient. So suppose x0 is a relative extrema, a max or a min. And for the sake of contradiction, that the derivative there is not 0. So let d be the direction of steepest ascent. Since x0 is a local extrema, there's some open ball of radius r for which f of x0 is maximal in the ball, if x0 is a local maximum, or f of x0 is minimal in the ball if x0 is a local minimum. Now note that the derivative of f at x0 times d is the gradient transpose times d. And of course, d is the normalized gradient. So in the numerator, I just have the norm squared divided by the norm. So of course, that's just equal to the norm of the gradient. In other words, the steepest slope. The derivative of f at x0 times d is the steepest slope at x0. And we're assuming, for the sake of contradiction, that that slope is not 0. Again, we could see that if we were to go in that direction, we would increase. If we go in the negative direction, we decrease. Right? We're supposing that the gradient is non-zero, so the norm of the gradient is strictly positive. Now, differentiability of f at x0 implies that there's some delta greater than zero, but less than or equal to the radius of the open ball in the previous slide, right? The uh, ball where x0 was either minimal or maximal, such that if x is some distance t away from x0, but in the direction of steepest ascent, so x is x0 plus t times d, then if the size of t is less than delta, then my difference quotient, right, f of x minus its linearization divided by the size of my perturbation is less than whatever I want. And well, I'm going to make it less than the gradient, the norm of the gradient divided by 2. Because remember, we're supposing that that's some positive number. And I can make this less than any positive number given the right choice of delta. Well, if x is x0 plus td, x minus x0 is just td. And d is a unit vector, so the norm of x minus x0 is just the absolute value of t. So if I multiply both sides by t, I get this expression. And then I replace this expression here. I factor out the t. The derivative times d, remember, is just the steepest slope, which is the norm of the gradient of f, right? That was in the previous slide. Right, since I have an absolute value, that means the inside of the absolute value is less than this term, but greater than the negative of this term. Then I can take this and add it to both sides, and I get this. All right, so now I have a lower and upper limit on the difference of f of x and f of x naught. Remember, t is an arbitrary number whose absolute value is less than delta, meaning t can be positive or negative. Suppose t is positive. Well, if t is positive, then the absolute value of t is just t, and this becomes 1 half t. So 0 is less than 1 half t times the norm of the gradient. Right, this is a positive number, and it's less than f of x minus f of x naught, implying f of x naught is less than f of x. But just as easily, t could be negative, in which case negative t plus its absolute value is just negative t over 2 times the norm of the gradient. So then this term, which is greater than this difference, is less than 0, meaning f of x is less than f of x naught. 
So both of these have to be true. Of course, these are different x's. This is an x corresponding to a positive t. This is an x corresponding to a negative t. Because remember, x, I'm traveling in the direction of steepest descent from x naught, either in a positive or negative direction. But the idea is that x, right, is still within my ball where x naught is supposed to be either minimal or maximal, but this says it's neither, right? This says there's an x in my ball uh, such that f of x is greater than f of x naught and less than f of x naught, implying that x naught is not a local extrema, but that contradicts our assumption. Therefore, it's not possible that x naught is a local extrema and the derivative is non-zero, which proves our theorem. So let's work out an example. Suppose f of x is 1 half x transpose times this matrix a, b, b, c times x. Notice that this matrix here in the quadratic term is symmetric. We'll talk about that more later. Plus the transpose of some given vector with x plus g. So let's show that if x naught minimizes this function, then x naught solves this equation. Now we can recall our linear algebra skills and work out what this expression is equal to, and we get this. We can take a derivative with respect to x1, take a derivative with respect to x2. Now, notice that this is the first entry of this matrix times x plus this vector. And this is the second entry of that. Therefore, if x not minimizes f, from our previous theorem, we know that x naught is a critical point, that is the derivative there is zero, which is the same thing as saying the gradient is zero. And of course the gradient is the matrix, I'm sorry, the gradient is the vector whose first entry is this and whose second entry is this. Well, these two entries are equivalent to my matrix times x naught plus this vector here that was in my linear term. Right, this is my quadratic term, my linear term, my constant term. So if that's zero, then x naught solves this equation. Now, by the way, if x naught maximizes f of x, then x naught also solves this equation. So given an expression like this, solving this equation gives us a potential minimum or maximum. But of course, it's possible that our solution is also a saddle point. But if x naught is a relative extrema, then x naught definitely solves this. Now recall that if f maps an open set in Rn to R is class C2, in other words, twice continuously differentiable, then the second derivative is a continuous mapping from the domain of f to a bilinear form. Right, that maps a an ordered pair from Rn to R. So at a given x in the domain, the second derivative of f at x is equivalent to a matrix, specifically the Hessian matrix. Now, notice I wrote the Hessian matrix is in R1 by n by n. Now, that's the same thing as Rn by n because we, we think of this as a square matrix. I write it this way just to emphasize that we think of this in terms of a bilinear form. It takes a vector in n and a vector in n and maps it to a vector in R1, in other words, a number. So the Hessian is the matrix of all the possible second derivatives, second partial derivatives. So if the second derivative is a bilinear form, in other words, it maps uh, an ordered pair uv, each in rn, to a number in r. Then the second derivative applied to the ordered pair uv is just u transpose times the Hessian times v. So what does the second derivative tell us about our extrema? Well, 
Well, suppose f maps an open u and r into r is class C2 and x naught is a critical point. That is the derivative of f at x naught is 0. Then if the second derivative at x naught, that is the Hessian, is negative definite, then x naught is a local max. Now, if x naught is a local max, then the second derivative we can say is definitely negative semi-definite. Now, what does negative definite mean and negative semi-definite? Well, we'll get to the definition in a second, but right now we should actually be thinking of this like we thought of the second derivative test back in calculus one. If the second derivative is negative, then that region is concave down and x naught is a local max if it's a critical point. So negative definite is the analog of what it means to be negative for a matrix rather than just a number as we would be dealing with in a calculus one type problem. And recall that if F is class C2, then the Hessian is a symmetric matrix. Now, of course, if the Hessian is positive definite, then X naught is a local minimum. And if X naught is a local minimum, then uh, the second derivative or the Hessian is positive semi-definite. Now, if it's neither positive definite nor negative definite, if it's indefinite, then X naught is a saddle point. That is a critical point that's neither a local min nor local max. So let's prove the uh, local max version of the second derivative test. Or rather, let's give a sketch of the proof. Suppose X naught is a critical point, then I can expand uh, F as much as Taylor will allows me to, given that F is class C2. So I know that F of X minus F of X naught is the derivative of F at X naught, which by the way is zero, plus one half times the second derivative operating on X minus X naught squared, or the ordered pair X minus X naught, X minus X naught. Now, the second derivative applied to that ordered pair is the same thing as x minus x naught transpose times my Hessian times x minus x naught. This goes away because it's zero, because x naught's a critical point. And this is less than zero because my second derivative is negative definite. Now, notice that it's negative definite at x naught, and this is not at x naught. However, because my second derivative is a continuous function, negative definiteness uh, is also continuous. In other words, if C is close enough to X naught, where I know I have negative definiteness, then the Hessian evaluated at C is also negative definite. Therefore, uh, this term here must be negative. And of course, if this is negative, then f of x is less than f of x naught, and x is any arbitrary point close enough to x naught. Now suppose that we know that x naught is a local maximum, and g of t is defined to be f of x naught plus t times x. Well then, obviously, g is maximal locally when t is zero. If I take the second derivative of g, I would get x transpose times the Hessian at x naught times x. And of course, since g of t has a local max, then my old-fashioned calculus one second derivative test so tells me that the second derivative has to be less than or equal to zero. And since x was arbitrary, 
then the Hessian is negative semi-definite. Okay, now let's define what we mean by positive definite. So the bilinear map that takes an ordered pair from Rn to R, or the matrix associated with the bilinear map. So if you remember uh, back to when we were discussing derivatives and what a bilinear map is, we said that given a basis for Rn, we can represent it as a matrix, so that the bilinear map on x, comma x is defined as x transpose times its matrix form times x. And so if this matrix or the bilinear map is positive definite, it means that for all non-zero x, this is strictly positive. Now, if I replace this inequality with a non-strict inequality, with the greater than or equal to, then that property is called positive semi-definite. And a bilinear map is negative definite if for non-zero x, x transpose times my matrix form times x is less than zero. Of course, if I replace it with a non-strict inequality with a less than or equal to, then we call it negative semi-definite. Now, when is a matrix positive definite or negative definite or indefinite? Well, I'm glad you asked. Now, recall that a symmetric matrix has only real eigenvalues. Now, why could we permit ourselves to consider for now just symmetric matrices? Well, remember that the bilinear form that we're really interested in right now in relation to the second derivative test is the Hessian matrix. And the Hessian matrix is symmetric if the function I'm considering is class C2. So if a matrix is symmetric, then it's positive definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of M are positive. And positive semi-definite if the eigenvalues are non-negative. It's negative definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of M are negative. Negative semi-definite if the eigenvalues are non-positive. And it's indefinite if and only if there are both positive and negative eigenvalues. So we see that the idea of positive definite, negative definite, or indefinite relates to the eigenvalues of our symmetric matrix. And I would argue that you could prove that. You may have to uh, dig back into some of your linear algebra concepts, but you could do it. But what if, what if a matrix is not symmetric? Right, suppose it's real, but not symmetric. Well, X transpose MX still is symmetric. How do I know that X transpose MX is symmetric? Well, X transpose MX is a number. And the transpose of a number, specifically a real number, is itself. So a real number is always a symmetric one by one matrix, if you will. That means X transpose MX equals X transpose M transpose X. So let's define ms as the sum of m and its transpose divided by 2. And note that ms is symmetric. Then x transpose mx equals x transpose mx over 2 plus x transpose m transpose x over 2. So I'm using the fact that x transpose mx and x transpose m transpose x are the same. So these two values in the numerator are the same. So I'm taking two of them and then dividing by half. So I just get this. Well, if I factor out my x's, I get x transpose times ms, which is known as the symmetric part of m times x. Well, 
So that's x transpose times the symmetric part of m times x. So in other words, if m is not symmetric, there is a symmetric matrix, specifically the symmetric part of m, for which x transpose mx is equal to. Thus, if m is an arbitrary real n by n matrix, then it's positive definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of its symmetric part are positive. Negative definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of its symmetric part are negative. And indefinite if and only if there are both positive and negative eigenvalues of its symmetric part. Now, another method of determining positive, negative, or indefiniteness involves the determinant. Let m be n by n, and suppose mk is the upper left k by k block of m. And so let's call delta k the determinant of that upper left k by k block. So delta 1 is the determinant of a one by one matrix, which is of course just that number. Uh, delta two is the determinant of a two by two, delta three the determinant of a three by three, and so on. Well, if delta k is always positive, then m is positive definite. If delta k flips sign in the same way that negative one to the k flips signs, in other words, Delta 1 is negative, delta 2 is positive, delta 3 is negative, so on and so forth. Then we can, we can conclude that m is negative definite. And if neither condition 1 or 2 holds, then this test is inconclusive and uh, seek ye therefore the eigenvalues of the symmetric part of m. So, how is this useful? Well, consider this quadratic function, and this is sometimes called a quadratic form, uh, and it's, it's the star of the show of subjects called quadratic programming. Right? Oftentimes, uh, there are applications that call on us to optimize, that is to minimize or, or maximize functions that have quadratic forms. So suppose we're given such a quadratic form where Q is a symmetric matrix. B is a number, A is a vector in Rn. How could I compute my relative extrema? By the way, if, if Q happened to come to you in a non-symmetric form, just replace Q with its symmetric part. you'll still get the same function. So first off, the derivative of my quadratic form is given by qx plus a, or transpose, because the derivative is the gradient transpose. So the gradient of f is qx plus a. So we find all critical points by solving q times xc equals negative a. Now if q is invertible, then I only have one critical point. So in that case, if my critical point is a local extrema, then it's a global extrema. And if Q is not invertible, that is Q is a singular matrix, then the critical points form an affine space or uh, a vector space if A is zero, right? Specifically the vector space corresponding to the null space of Q. And on that space, F is constant. In other words, the derivative in that space is zero. So that means that if X is a local extrema, then it's a non-unique global extrema. Now, the Hessian of this matrix is just Q. And again, if Q is not symmetric, we can replace Q with its symmetric part. 
Thus, the eigenvalues of Q or the pattern of delta K, right, are determinants of submatrices, will tell us whether we have a global minimum, maximum, or saddle point. In fact, we don't actually need all the eigenvalues of Q. We just need the leftmost and rightmost eigenvalues of Q. Remember that Q, if it's symmetric, necessarily has real eigenvalues. And if Q is not symmetric, we just swap it with its symmetric part, and we have the same function. Now remember that if F is class CP, where P is at least three, then I can express F as a quadratic function plus a remainder. All right, so this is the remainder of my second order Taylor expansion, which is this term here. And if Y is sufficiently small, then this remainder term is small, meaning that if Y is close to zero or X is close to X naught, then f of x or f of y is close to a quadratic function because again this remainder term is small. Now the Morse lemma takes this idea a step further than Taylor. Right? Taylor says that I'm near a quadratic. Morse says I can reshape the space you're in so that F becomes exactly a quadratic. So Morse lemma says, if F maps an open subset of R into R, if F is smooth and X naught is a non-degenerate critical point, meaning that X naught is a critical point and the Hessian at X naught is an invertible matrix, then there exists a smooth and invertible function H on some neighborhood U of zero, such that H maps zero to X naught, and of course H inverse maps X naught to zero, for which the composition of F and H, so we can think of H as a smooth invertible warping of Rn. But of course, if it's invertible, right, it means we can go back and forth between uh, the warping of Rn and back to Rn. So the composition of F and this H, which we would call a change of variables or a smooth warping of Rn, this composition is exactly a quadratic function. And notice that there's no linear term because X naught is a critical point. And this quadratic term is a very simple matrix. It's a matrix where the diagonals are all positive or negative one and the off diagonals are zero. Now, of course, if K is zero, then I just get the identity, right? Which is clearly a positive definite. And if K is N, then I get the negative identity, in which case this matrix is negative definite. And if K is between one and N, then I have an indefinite. But the idea is that I can warp my space so that F becomes exactly a quadratic. Now note F of X is this function applied to H inverse of X. Right, because the composition of H and H inverse of X is just X, right? Because they undo each other. And K here is called the index of the critical point. Okay. 
So here, H is what is sometimes called a, a change of variables. Uh, not in the sense of choosing a new basis, right? That would be a change of coordinates. But it's a change of variables. In other words, it's away from going from Rn to a smooth and invertible warping of Rn, where in the smooth and invertible warping, we could, we could kind of reshape F to be precisely a quadratic, in which case we can evaluate F uh, as we did the quadratic form in the previous example. Well, that's all for today.